All right. Good morning, everyone. I think uh, it's probably a good idea if we get started. And uh, there are still people filtering through the waiting room, but I will try and talk and admit them at the same time. So uh, my name is Chris Butlett, and I am the Marketing and Communication Manager with the Dutch Cycling Embassy based in Utrecht in the Netherlands. Uh, it's my pleasure to be your host, MC, uh, and uh, moderator today. Um, so thank you for joining us. We know there was uh, a great deal of interest in this session uh, and uh, hopefully uh, this lives up to your expectations in terms of the content that we deliver. Uh, I want to thank the, the Consul General in Toronto for their support of this project and also um, the City of Toronto themselves. So Katie Whitman at uh, the City of Toronto and, and, and Sabira at the Consul General have worked very hard on bringing this event together over the last two months, and, and yeah, hopefully it uh, it pays off with uh, with with some great uh, momentum moving forward. Um, so here is the itinerary for today. Uh, we have about two hours set aside for uh, discussion and uh, deliberation. Um, just want to draw your attention to the fact that this event is being recorded for those people who couldn't attend. There were over 50 people on the wait list that uh, we couldn't admit, uh, but we are going to provide them with a recording of at least the plenary sessions and the, uh, the wrap up at the end. We will not record the individual breakout rooms to allow you to talk freely, uh, but please, so please uh, don't feel like you're being monitored in, in that se section of the, of the program, but the rest of the program we are, will be recording for uh, future use. Um, yeah, we are, uh, we have three uh, opening discussions. Uh, and uh, first, uh, Jacqueline Haywood uh, is the Director of, of Project Design and Management at Transportation Service at the City of Toronto, uh, has the, the honor of uh, making some opening remarks. So Jacqueline, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Chris. Good morning, everyone. It sounds like it's quite a hot ticket to be here today. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to be with you here as well. Um, this is an exciting time for cycling infrastructure in the city of Toronto. There's a great deal of community support and an amazing amount of staff energy across the board. Um, and we know that we have partner municipalities and engineering firms attending today with us too, um, to help us all kind of up our level of, uh, of design knowledge together. Um, the section that I have the pleasure to lead within the City of Toronto Transportation Services um, delivers cycling infrastructure projects um, specifically, as well as integrated as part of Vision Zero safety projects, part of major infrastructure projects, and, and part of streetscape improvement projects, essentially to say that everybody within Transportation Services at the City of Toronto has a responsibility of making cycling infrastructure better. And that goes further to say that our partners in engineering and construction services who are here with us in this training um, are also responsible for making cycling infrastructure better in the city of Toronto. Um, so we're glad to have everybody here as partners. I wanna thank as well, Katie, for the efforts in organizing today um, with our organizing partners at the Dutch Cycling um, Consulate and the Dutch Embassy. And I also want to thank the people who've stood up to be breakout leads um, with us for the, for the rest of the morning, Dave, Becky, Karina, Owen, and Kanchin. I think we all have a lot to learn today, and I'm really excited about, um, about this opportunity to, um, to learn from each other. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jacqueline. And without any further ado, I will pass the floor to uh, Harman Edima, who is the uh, newly installed uh, Consul General for uh, Toronto, uh, who I know is very passionate about cycling and, and would like to share a few words about uh, his uh, own story. Harman? Yes, thank you, Chris. I've been here for seven, six or seven weeks now, and um, um, I come to work every day on a bicycle. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. And if I'm not mistaken, Jacqueline is wearing something orange. I don't know if that's for the Dutch, uh, uh, the Dutch, you know, national color, but it's very nice to see uh, Jacqueline. I like, I appreciate that. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I'm the Consul General of the Kingdom of the Netherlands in Toronto. My team and I have the great mission to improve the trade between our two countries uh, by sharing best practices and building partnerships like we're doing right now. Um, there are about 1 million uh, Canadian citizens with Dutch roots in Canada and half of them live in Ontario. 
And many of them arrived in the 1950s uh, after Canadians played such an important role in liberating our country from the Germans. Um, in size, of course, the Netherlands is a lot smaller than Canada. Um, in economic terms, Canada ranks the world's ninth largest economy and the Netherlands 17th. But uh, in terms of, uh, of rankings, um, the Netherlands is the world's second largest agricultural exporter and we rank in the global top five on, among others, health, care, innovation, logistics, happiest people, and of course, bicycle infrastructure and bicycle friendliness. About 75% of the Dutch kids uh, usually take the bicycle to school. And especially now that electric bicycles are common good in the Netherlands, also older people take the bike more often and up to a later age. So it increases their happiness and their independence. Now that's, that means our infrastructure needs to be good. Um, until last year, my mom, my 85 year old mom used to go on a bicycle on a daily basis. Um, and those of you who have traveled to the Netherlands know that in the cities by far the best way to get around is on a bicycle. Now I often hear, and you'll probably hear it again today is, uh, but where we are, it is not Amsterdam. Well, while that may be true, and it is true, I just want to let you know that Amsterdam wasn't Amsterdam either. During the 50s, 60s, and 70s of last century, more and more cars uh, were taking the streets in Amsterdam, and pollution made the city dirty and gray. That was in the 70s. Uh, bicycles were marginalized, and there were just a tremendous number of traffic uh, casualties, especially children, young children who couldn't play on the streets anymore. And there were a lot of incidents. And it actually caused a public outrage and a lot of demonstration. And as a result of those, uh, that public pressure, the government changed its focus. So urban planning policies gradually evolved and started considering the bicycle as part of the mobility. And the bicycle regained an importance in the cities and in city planning, and a bicycle infrastructure construction program came into place in Amsterdam. And all these kind of initiatives transformed the city uh, to a place where children, where the older people, rich and poor, the king and the queen cycled. That is our national DNA. But yes, so this, is, this has a history and it didn't come from nowhere. Um, and even right now, uh, we are still working on this. There are many initiatives to promote the use of a bicycle. For example, uh, focused on long distances for electric bicycles. There are financial incentives for people who, who will exit their car and will take their bike to work. So they get a financial incentive. And there are more and more bicycle freeways between the cities. So it's not just within those small little cities, which you think Holland has, which which is true, but also between the cities. And that are more the distances like you have here in Greater Toronto area. Lesson learned, this didn't change overnight. It was a step-by-step -step process. And with bike lanes, our experience has been build them and people will ride them. So on a more general level, I believe that our societies face um, similar challenges uh, with regards to livability uh, and accessibility. Um, and of course, this just not just covers bicycles and mobility, but also green spaces and sustainable architecture. And all of this, I strongly believe in partnerships. So um, they are, I think they're mutually enriching. Uh, they stimulate new and innovative approaches and um, also responses to our common challenges that we, that we share. Uh, and that is exactly the aim of today's uh, webinar on cycling infrastructure design discussions. Of course, the Ontario situation has its own characteristics, but we've noticed that there's a manifest interest in uh, the Dutch experience. The reason boom in Paris um, was concocted with intensive collaboration with the Dutch. Experts from the Netherlands share their views and experience regularly uh, on the best practice that, that we have seen in our policies. But it's e easier to say than to do this because um, Bike friendliness involves so many different aspects of planning, regulating, organizing, and implementing. It demands a comprehensive approach, um, but you can also just try it out, uh, as Toronto has seen in the past uh, two year, year and a half. And I've, I've just been amazed how, 
how much fun it is to take your bike downtown and go to from High Park to Distillery District to the beaches. And it's so bicycle friendly with all the bikes she has around. Uh, I do I do hear that they steal a lot of your parts of your bike if you lock them. That's why so far I've only taken bikes here. So I'm very happy to partner up with the city of Toronto, with the Dutch Cycling Embassy, uh, to offer a platform for Dutch and Canadian experts to share their experience. So thanks a lot for your cooperation. I hope this workshop will be productive, uh, will strengthen our ties, will strengthen our biking communities, and I hope it will result into future cooperation and partnerships between our cities, between our countries, and um, hopefully um, I can uh, bike around here for the next four years, increasingly using more and more bicycle paths and bicycle infrastructure in Toronto. Thank you very much, Chris, back to you. All right, thanks, Harman. I told you he was passionate about cycling. Uh, I wasn't kidding. All right, so, um, I'm just going to say a few words about the Dutch Cycling Embassy, uh, just so you know who we are and, and what we do. Um, I've had this pleasure of working with them for two and a half years now as a, a native Canadian, actually. Uh, but we really bring uh, the best knowledge and expertise that exists in this country to cities and regions around the world. And uh, every day is different. We get inquiries from, yes, Paris, Tokyo, Moscow, Sydney. Uh, Toronto, Bogota, you name it, uh, we have the pleasure of, of working there. Um, we are a public-private partnership of about 80 different organizations that work in the field of cycling. So they are private consultants, three of whom you're going to hear from today, uh, but also from the public sector, municipal governments, provincial governments, uh, the National Rail uh, Infrastructure Company, uh, technology uh, companies, bicycle manufacturers, bicycle parking manufacturers, uh, if they work in the field of cycling internationally, generally uh, they're part of our network and we're able to bring them to the table for these types of webinars and workshops. So we, at least pre-COVID, uh, worked kind of in two, two directions. We would bring study tours and groups to the Netherlands um, to show them the Dutch context, to help them get in inspired and informed by Dutch cities, show them cities that were familiar to where they were coming from, at least relatable. Uh, get them on a bicycle, but also put them in a classroom setting to help them understand what they saw and how it is translatable to their hometown. Inversely, uh, we also take teams of Dutch experts internationally hosting Think Bike workshops, uh, which work on specific challenges, case studies, problems that that city is experiencing, kind of like what we're doing today, but in a more extended format over three or four days, where we're able to actually sit down around a table with some sketch paper uh, and, and some slide decks and, and work through uh, not just coming up with solutions, but starting that knowledge transfer and that uh, that discussion process uh, process between uh, the Netherlands and and that host country. Obviously, post COVID, we have uh, moved a lot of this work to a more virtual setting, hosting webinars, virtual workshops, virtual study tours. Uh, but we have started hosting groups again here in the Netherlands in the last couple of weeks, uh, and started booking our first workshops for early 2022. So we're hoping that. Yeah, uh, that we will hopefully in a, be in a room together again sooner rather than later. We've developed all kinds of different resources. I won't spend too much time on these, but we have a book of best practices that's available to download for free. That's uh, about 60, 50 or 60 case studies of projects in the Netherlands uh, that are bike parking, bike policy, uh, intersection design that really touch on lessons for an international audience and what they can uh, bring back to their hometown. We've uh, uh, produced a series of knowledge clips. They're five minute videos on a variety of topics uh, that are up on our YouTube channel that are available to view and download and distribute for free. Uh, and last but not least, we've recently uh, produced this Bikeonomics pamphlet that helps people understand with this growing field of Bikeonomics uh, and how investing in cycling brings a much bigger return to society in terms of um, uh, sustainable economic development. So let's just uh, take a moment to put this, this uh, moment in context. We are going through an unprecedented bike boom. Harman mentioned Paris, but it, it really is almost every city in the world. Bike shops are selling out of, of their stock and, and people are using their bicycle to get around because uh, it's a resilient and reliable mode of transport. Uh, it also helps them deal with uh, their physical and mental health. And I think that's something we've all gained an appreciation for over the last uh, year and a half. Lots of cities have built pop-up infrastructure, but there's one country that really hasn't. Uh, and and uh, surprising to some people, but 
uh, it helps if it helps you uh, understand that those networks, those pop-up infrastructures that cities were building, largely already exist in the Netherlands and were starting to be built 40 or 50 years ago. Um, as Harman mentioned, it wasn't uh, wasn't a single light bulb moment, but a series of converging crises, not too dissimilar to uh, what we went through with COVID, uh, an oil shortage, and a road safety crisis in the early 1970s that really set their society on a different path in terms of looking at uh, a more diverse and, and resilient transportation system and started to use their streets for for more than one use, and that is uh, moving cars. So. It's not to say that it was a, an easy or straightforward path. There were mistakes made along the way. Uh, demonstration projects that were uh, protested by shopkeepers, ripped out by construction workers, uh, routes that were deemed failures and, and not used by the public uh, because they were really just trying trying things, the Dutch, uh, for a period of 10 to 20 years. And, and it's only now, uh, with decades of experience behind their belt, that they have really developed uh, 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 manuals of best practice that we can now take the cities around the world and help them learn from those the, the errors that, that the Dutch made over the decades. Um, the biggest thing that we always emphasize is starting at the network level, and I know uh, that's one of the discussions we will have today, is rather than designing individual routes, look at a cohesive uh, network, and uh, we do through that uh, design and, uh, or the trial and error pro uh, process in the 70s, uh, the Dutch developed these five principles uh, of, of network design, which we now take to cities around the world. That is directness, comfort, cohesion, attractiveness, and safety. So this will give you a sense of, of how popular cycling is, how prevalent cycling is. In the Netherlands, I'm not gonna go through all of these statistics, but it's really mind boggling. Uh, obviously Amsterdam gets all the attention, but there are actually uh, 202 different municipalities in the Netherlands where the cycling mode share exceeds the car mode share. So it's done in small villages and towns. It's done in the big metropolitan areas. Uh, they've created a cycling nation where cycling is done virtually everywhere and not just in the big cities. Uh, and in response to that, that road safety crisis in the 1970s, they've also, through the sustainable safety policies, um, created a road network that results in the fewest uh, uh, fatalities for people on foot and on bicycle. Um, and uh, this cannot be emphasized enough that it, if you build uh, cohesive, complete streets, it's not just the, uh, the people on bikes who benefit, uh, the pedestrians also can uh, experience these safe conditions, uh, contrary to what the New York Times might be saying about uh, the Paris experience over the weekend. So that was uh, a very fast, quick, uh, introduction to the Dutch Cycling Embassy and what we do. Uh, and I'm now going to hand the floor to uh, Thomas and, and Richard from Hadapel, um, who have the first of three plenaries that we're presenting from the, the Dutch consultancies today. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, gentlemen, and you are welcome to take the floor from here. Thank you. Hi, good to meet you, everyone. Can you see my presentation? Just wanted to check. You can't. Not yet. Share, share again. There you go. That's working. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Thomas. I'm here with my colleague uh, Richard and another Thomas and Weinand. So we're four of us uh, and very happy to be here. And we're going to talk to you about the very powerful combination of cycling and, uh, and transit. Um, but first, a little bit about Gautapel very briefly. I have only 10 minutes and there's so much I wanted to tell you. So about our company, we have 55 years of experience, over 250 mobility experts from design, data, modeling, planning, uh, the whole package. And our, our basis is a vision that, that strives for better cities for everyone. And we do this through an integrated approach, looking at all the modes uh, that are available. And we very much do this supported by data uh, and research and, and state of the art models. And good to highlight that we also have a, a partner in, in Canada, in, in planning and Michelle Kearns is also present uh, today. Very briefly about me and that's also the connection. So I spent one year in, in Toronto 2019-2020. I cycled the whole year. I cycled 
the whole region. So I have a bit of a feel about the opportunities and challenges uh, that you face, but I feel that there's a lot to work on, but there's also kind of uh, a lot of positive signs also already highlighted by, uh, by Harm. I'm gonna talk about three things, a little bit about theory, about cycling and transit integration, about network design and how to look at the station area uh, specifically. Um, so in the Netherlands, we say that the combination of bike and transit is maybe the only mode that really can compete with the car. So you have the flexibility on the one hand of door-to-door -door travel, but on the other hand, the higher speeds that you need to, to also uh, uh, go a longer distances within a metropolitan region. So this bike train combination uh, can be the only kind of mode that really could compete, compete with the private car. And it actually has been the fastest growing uh, trip chain or, or mode in the Netherlands for the last 15 or 20 years. So it's very important not to look at those systems separately, but plan them, plan them really as one system. And even if you compare it with walking, if we just make the simple comparison of the catchment areas of the current uh, uh, GO train system and the underground system in Toronto, you see the tremendous difference in terms of your catchment area with 10 minutes of cycling uh, as opposed to 10 minutes of walking. You, you almost already cover most of, most of the region. But of course, to make these circles real, you have to do a lot uh, to, make this, uh, to make this happen. But you really have to plan them as, as, as one system. And it's good to stress that there can also be competition. Actually, the investments that also were highlighted at the beginning in the inner cities of the of the Dutch uh, towns and cities that actually led to a decline of local transit systems. Yeah? So what we see is that actually cycling works better with higher order transit. Yeah? So in terms of comparing it to Toronto, it's more about connecting to the Metro, connecting to the GO train, and maybe to really uh, kind of rapid uh, bus, uh, bus transit, but cycling would compete more with the downtown streetcar and maybe also with the regular buses running on the uh, arterials. Yeah? So you really have to think about which markets you want to you want to focus on, yeah? but it could also be an increase the cost effectiveness of your transit. Yeah? So increase the stop spacing of the bus that yeah? makes it more attractive to bike to the bus, but also make the bus faster for for uses and increases the overall uh, overall performance. Um, so if we think about the the network design. I think we always uh, in the Netherlands were very used to looking at the whole network. And I just took kind of a screenshot of, of part of the urban grid in Toronto. And, and you have kind of east-west, you have lots of, of, uh, of metro stops. And I think the first thing to look at is kind of how can we increase this, this local catchment area? How can we improve the, uh, the, uh, the, the access for pedestrians to the station? And I, I guess most of the cyclists uh, in east-west direction, the next uh, subway stop is really close, but especially in north-south direction, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, probably a pretty big, uh, big catchment area where you want to focus on. And the big question is, do you want to mix traffic on the bigger arterials or actually maybe do you use the more quiet uh, back streets for actually a more nicer pedestrian environment? And I noticed that I actually tended to like those, uh, those streets a bit more, but of course you have to have uh, connectivity to the station in the end. And then maybe on the main, uh, the main arterial through, you really want to focus on improving uh, the, bus, uh, the bus product and the connection to the, to, the, to the station. And then of course, always the difficult uh, task for politician, but that maybe also means that on this main uh, arterial running up to the station, you maybe do not want to promote the car too much. And maybe you want to slow down car traffic or those streets connecting into the transit system create more space for cycling, create more space also for your transit connection, and then uh, concentrate the car traffic on the other streets. And sometimes you get, yeah, but then the other street gets much busier, but we also often see that if you slow traffic down, that actually part of the car traffic just evaporates or moves to other, to other modes. So what is kind of your multimodal network strategy in terms of connecting into the, into the transit system? And it's really important to look at these local catchment areas. Eh? Also in the Netherlands, after a certain distance, the, the number of users of the station drops dramatically. And so catch as, as much as you can. And we often see that there are barriers, big roads or, or, or a waterway uh, that actually hampers uh, these catchment areas. I actually noticed a lot of GO train stations in the region where you could only get out on one side of the station and, and there could be a, a, a 
could be a dwelling. So the other side where there was no connection at all. And so increase those catchment areas. You could do very simple GIS analysis of where your, your barriers are and, 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 and how much uh, uh, more there uh, room for improvement there is. And if we then move closer into the, to the station design, and, and I think it's really about active modes first. And you get most of your riders you get from, from people walking and cycling uh, to the station, uh, it's kind of linked to the, the density around the station. So you, you have to think about what is my main route, my main pedestrian active route into the station. And on the side, you have your cycling connections uh, running into the station. We know that cyclists hate to walk uh, uh, too long to the platform. So maybe you need two, uh, two sets of bike parking, one on, on, on one side of the station and one on the other. And we move the, uh, uh, the connection with transit and we move the connection with the car actually more to the side because it doesn't create a very attractive uh, environment, kind of buses waiting or cars uh, uh, waiting, but I will get a little bit more into detail, uh, into the detail later. And, and especially park and ride and maybe also the bus uh, buffer can be, can be placed further away or even, even better. Huh? In the end, we know that most of your riderships actually comes from people living nearby. So do we actually need park and ride at, uh, at inner city uh, metro stations or actually do we think about uh, uh, adding a further density? Uh, this also creates ice on the street, uh, improves uh, safety uh, and also maybe uh, creates uh, extra uh, uh, room for local amenities. And maybe we put the connection to the bus system if there's an opportunity at the back of the station. So there you have like the more uh, a, a transit connection, uh, but that doesn't always create for a very nice pedestrian environment. And then the other side of the station, we really focus on the, on the active, uh, active mode. First. How does that look in practice? Just an example of the station of Apeldoorn in blue. We see the main cycle connection to the, to the downtown. You see that there's bike parking on both sides of the station. There's actually a bicycle tunnel underneath the, uh, the station that, the, that they built. So they put the car traffic on the south side of the station, so not on the side where you want to create your most attractive urban environment, where you see the big, uh, the big blue, uh, blue circle. I'll show a picture uh, uh, later of how that looks. And also the connection to the bus is, is more to the side. If you have an, a nice and attractive square in front of the station, people uh, uh, that, that need to go to the bus, they don't mind to actually walk a little bit, uh, walk a little bit more. And they can also use this square actually to, to wait a little bit. Uh, and actually in, in, in the Apeldoorn case, it's really funny that actually kind of in 2020, we're kind of back where we were in 1912. Uh, so in, in 1912, the, the square looked like this. In the meantime, we also put the cars in front of the station and we also made the, the mistakes that, that, that we tried to repair. And now in 2020, it looks like uh, on the right side, a very nice environment, a bicycle tunnel underneath the, underneath the station. So, so you got to plan and learn uh, uh, over time. And I wanted to stress really, especially on transit nodes, connections, that user experience is key. Uh, people hate to wait. Uh, uh, so if you if you wait in an unpleasant environment, time seems to take longer. But if you wait in an environment that is pleasant, then the time uh, seems seems shorter. So do not only focus on what transport engineers often do, only on safety, reliability, speed, ease of use, but also very much focus on the top side of the of the customer pyramid, comfort and experience, because those are the satisfiers that keep people kind of in the end, uh, changing their behavior uh, in, the, in, in the long run. An example from Italy, because they've done some really interesting uh, research uh, from Naples. It's not always a city that comes uh, in the news for the right reasons, but in terms of uh, designing their metro stations, uh, they are quite exceptional. And, and of course the Italians, sometimes they, uh, they overdo it, but this is the new metro in, in Naples. And they, uh, they looked at the catchment area of this station and compared it to an old station. So the, the quality of the transit surface is the same, but the design is completely different and it almost doubles your catchment area. Uh, so you get twice as much people going into the station and also much more, much more wind. Of course, that was quite extravagant, but this is a very simple example from, uh, from the Netherlands. So a station. So the first thing that you do is clear the area. So there's always a lot of clutter in front of the station, a signpost uh, uh, and so on, but move that all to the side, your ticket machines and your information, organize your functions, a clear visual marker, 
could be a very simple statue or, or in this case a screen. There is a place to rest and it creates very, very simple environment. And the bike parking is, is just, uh, just next, to, next to the tree. So this is what we call the reception area of the station. So it's very simple, doesn't have to cost a lot, but it makes a world of a difference in how you integrate the, the modes and, and how people arrive at this, at this spot. And of course, at, at some bigger stations, it's very important to have the whole package. Yeah? So also look at surface, bike repair. The, it's very handy if you can bring your bike in the morning at the metro station. You go to work uh, with the metro and at the end of the day, your, your flat tire is repaired. And of course, in your last mile, uh, using your transit card to also connect to the bike share system, which is very uh, fast growing in, in use. And of course, the whole wayfinding at all the stations is the same. It's very clear where I, where I can find the bike parking. It's very clear where I can find the bike share and which uh, access or entry I, uh, I need to use. So to finish it off, eh, in the end, it's about improving the value of time that, uh, that people have. Eh, and, and, and most of the time being underway on your bike or in transit is kind of a hassle. Uh, but we can, can improve that, that building, then building uh, closer to our transit stop, eh, increasing density. I don't have a last mile connection anymore. Improving the connection to the station by bike eh, makes it faster, but also if I can park my bike more easily, make the transfer faster. But in the end, also think about nicer, eh, improving the quality of the bike parking, improving the quality of the reception area of the station. Uh, that in the end is also a very important, important strategy. And of course, uh, then to take it over the top, this is the, uh, the new bike, bike parking the new bike parking at Utrecht Central Station, the biggest station in the Netherlands. 12 and a half thousand uh, uh, bikes uh, can be parked there every day. It's the biggest uh, bicycle parking in, uh, in the world, 24 seven open. It has three floors. And uh, so this is kind of at the end of the road. If you do all this, then maybe Union Station in the future. I think Toronto is a bigger city. So then you would probably need 25,000 uh, bike parking spots or somewhere in that, uh, in that region. Uh, I hope this, uh, this gives a first idea and uh, during the breakout session, we would also show designs for, uh, for some of the, uh, the cases brought in, uh, in, in by the city and go into more detail in, uh, in some of the design questions of connecting uh, cycling to transit. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Thomas. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna pass it right on over to Mary Elbeck from Mobicon for the second plenary. Mary, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. And Thomas, I'm kicking you off of screen share and here we go. All right, uh, can everyone see uh, what I'm seeing? Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, thanks so much. We're happy to be here. Uh, I'm Mary Elbeck and I lead Mobicon's US office. And I started working in this field actually when I was in Denmark. Um, and so don't tell the Danish cycling embassy, but it was when I was living in Denmark that I actually started learning more about what was happening in the Netherlands and just how fantastic the, the Dutch approach uh, is. So I am also joined by my colleague, Leonard Nout. Uh, he's a fantastic urban designer and the manager of our international strategy. Uh, so he's based in our Delft office. Um, so I'll be presenting here where we're gonna start to uh, look at access management and, and uh, it's a bit of a teaser for the breakout room where we're gonna dive deeper into intersections. Uh, so a little bit about Mobicon. At Mobicon, both company-wide as well as on a personal level, um, we like to help the world be less dependent on the car. Uh, we do this across our five offices in the Netherlands, Canada, and the US. Um, and some of the ways in which we do that are through study tours, uh, which are also virtual now, of course, uh, capacity building, planning and designing for all modes, um, as well as balancing those modes with a very important human need for, uh, for not moving or staying in, in quality public spaces. So one of the reasons that you're here, I think, uh, listening to presentations by people from uh, another country, another continent, uh, is because of the Dutch commitment to transportation systems for all road users, particularly our most vulnerable road users. Don't have to sell you all on, on the Dutch approach. Um, but uh, like uh, Herman and Chris have already talked about, it definitely wasn't always this way. Uh, the Netherlands hasn't been too different in their 
uh, from North America with their, their auto-centric uh, uh, culture. So here's a, a chart to go right along with what they've been saying. Um, we can see that rise in fatalities right up until the early 70s, uh, where it starts to, uh, where it peaks and starts to drop down quite quickly. Um, like they said, this was sort of the, the public tolerance for uh, too many kids um, dying in traffic, um, also probably coinciding with the oil crisis. Uh, uh, sort of the, the government started to introduce road safety measures, some pretty major ones like seatbelt and alcohol laws. Um, the ones we're going to talk about today come a little bit after the positive results of those policies start to level off. So this is looking more into the 80s and 90s. And um, with this, we're going to be looking at sustainable safety. So the Dutch uh, um, equivalent of Vision Zero, um, or what is often referred to as the safe systems approach, um, but all with the same idea. And that is that traffic fatalities are both uneth unethical and preventable. Um, and so therefore it's our job as transportation professionals to prevent them. Uh, so sustainable safety has five key principles. Uh, one of those principles is functionality or determining the function of a roadway. Um, access management is buried a little bit into that, into that category and we're, we're gonna try and tease it out. Uh, so in the Netherlands, uh, they keep it quite simple. We've got our two rows here uh, for the, the not built up area or rural, um, and then for the built up area. So looking at our urban and suburban areas. And within each of these, uh, we have the same three columns. These are the categories or function of roadway. We have our access roads for slow speeds uh, where people can reach their destination, their residential streets, um, we have our distributor roads. These are connecting people from point A to point B um, or to their, to their access roads. They're sort of first mile, last mile uh, road connectors. And of course, the roads or, or freeways. Um, and each of these functions comes with a clear prescription for, uh, for the bicycle facility. So focusing on our built up area at speeds of 30 kilometers an hour or slower, traffic can mix on the street, bikes, cars, sometimes pedestrians, and then uh, anywhere higher than this, uh, if they're posted or um, actual speeds, uh, they must be separated or protected facilities. Um, and then anything higher than that, you're through roads, that's um, obviously not an option for active transportation. So where access management starts to come into play here, is that access is really only allowed on the access streets. Uh, so you're turning, uh, most of your turning movements into driveways, parking spaces, um, whatnot. These are, these are really only happening at slow speeds. Uh, so we know that injuries and fatalities happen when you get conflict zones where people are turning or crossing uh, paired with high speeds. Um, so high, in this case being anything above 30K. So this division of roadway function, um, you know, really allows for access streets to have conflicts, but at those really low, not going to hurt you speeds, and then distributor roads to prioritize faster movement, but they're really minimizing the, the conflict zones. Um, so not allowing for driveways or turning into your sort of large big box uh, store parking lots. Um, and by fully separating active transportation from cars and protected bikeways and not least at intersections with protected intersections. Uh, we do have similar road categories, of course, in North America, um, but we also have a lot of roads that act in this sort of gray area, trying to act as both a local street and a distributor road, resulting in the roads um, that have way too many turning movements at way too high speeds. So on our next slide here, uh, let's look at what this categorization of roads looks like on a grid. Uh, so here we've got our three roads with the dark gray lines, the distributor roads with the medium gray lines, and the access with the lightest, of course. Uh, so one of the things I, I think is interesting about this is just noting how many of the roads are these access roads. The majority of them are these kind of smaller, quieter, slower uh, 30K roads. And one of the other things you'll notice is that they only intersect with other access roads and distributor roads. So there's no connection between your access road and your, your through roads or highways. Uh, one of the other little tidbits I, I learned that still fascinates me today when I started uh, learning more about the Dutch approach um, is that 80% of their roads are 30 kilometers an hour or slower. Uh, so looking something like this, maybe they're not all this nice, 
but there's still about 80% of the roads are have this sort of very uh, uh, quiet feel. Um, when I think about this, it's, it's kind of a, it's a mix of um, envy, like awe, also just you know, how do they do it? How do they, how do they do uh, this for almost 80% of the roads and also have some of the world's most satisfied drivers according to ways, um, a bit mind boggling for my American mind. Um, but one of the ways they do it is with a bit of traffic psychology. Uh, this is a chart based on research from Hans Mundermann, the father of shared space. Uh, so on our left-hand side, we've got our divisions by road category. And then on the bottom, we have our duration of travel. Uh, and so we see at speeds of 30 kilometers an hour in urban areas, people are willing to drive the speed for about six minutes. Then we need to provide them that faster, uh, that faster distributor route. At distributor road speeds, people are willing to drive about 50 kilometers an hour, again, in urban areas uh, for up to nine minutes um, before their patience runs thin and they really need to uh, have access or be able to drive on that through road. So if we apply this back to our grid, um, we can see each one of these is accessible within the timeframes uh, noted by Mundermann staircase. So car and access road area traveling at 30K can reach a distributor road in six minutes and so on. And so this really allows for these kind of traffic calmed islands um, of, of slow access roads, um, which also eliminates the need for tons of heavy separated infrastructure. So what we've seen with sustainable safety is that when we categorize roads according to these three main functions and, and really try to stick to those functions and minimize the, the gray areas, the strodes, um, we end up with inherently safe streets that are intuitive to use and that also have the, the consequence of, of inviting people to, uh, to walk and cycle. Uh, and since the, uh, which also leads to lower fatalities and injuries, of course, um, so since the implementation of sustainable safety, roadway fatalities have continued to fall. Um, and so this is sort of our, our core here, uh, but we all know that the intersections are our weakest link. So we're going to continue on with intersections in the breakout rooms, um, but that is, um, that's us for now. So thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Mary. And uh, last but not least, we have Hans or connect from a new kike. Hans, are you uh, ready to go? Hans, we can see your screen, but we can't hear you. I think you're currently muted. Yeah, so try again. Sorry, my excuse. Um, my name is Hans Voortnecht. I was the, actually the first Think Bike Workshop was in Toronto and I was there live. And hopefully this uh, uh, online workshop, this virtual workshop will lead to another live workshop because what I realized that it's so important to be there, to to see the city, to feel the city, and uh, well, unfortunately, uh, uh, it's not true. So this is the best we can do. And uh, well, I was one of the people, uh, one of the founding fathers of the Dutch Cycling Embassy. So it's very uh, nice that we're back in Toronto. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, bridges and underpasses, and it will be uh, mostly about bridges. Um, um, well, I introduced myself. Maybe it's also nice for Kenshin and Owen to introduce themselves. Well, I don't hear anything, so maybe that's later. Well, the background is I will go to tell you why bicycle bridges are so important. And my what I'm doing now is a lot of uh, uh, looking at how the daily urban, urban system, so the total of 
mobility uh, amenities and uh, and uh, the the spatial division of the of the space um, will function in order to get people to have accessible jobs uh, amenities uh, um, and social context so I'm very much for every group in the in the in the um, uh, society so I'm very much at the equ equity inclusion and I will show that this is important also when you look at bicycle bridges then we have some Toronto examples and then some Dutch uh, guidance and examples and later we will go to the case case study well first thing um, uh, an example of the Netherlands when you look in the Netherlands you see the when you look at the number of accessible labor places by income class then you see that people with a higher income class have a lot better accessibility than people with a at a lower income class and one of the things is that people with a lower income class usually have uh, are not uh, cannot afford a car and when you don't have a car it's often very hard to uh, access uh, a labor place well and you see that in amsterdam it's much better for people with a low income so the uh, income inequality is a lot uh, um, less there and when you look at the this map you see uh, how important uh, the bike and the public transport is compared to the car and here you see in the middle of amsterdam that the number of jobs you can reach by uh, bike and transit are one and a half times as much as the number of jobs you can uh, reach can access by car so and you see that also in the middle of amsterdam uh, only uh, there the, the number of uh, cars uh, per household is 0 0.2 so only one in five households has a car because everybody knows you can access jobs and anything you want without a car and that leads you see to a lot less um transport inequality so you know if you want to have more equity then you need uh, a better uh, um, uh, also a better bicycle access and um bicycle bridges uh, can help to level the, uh, the it, to achieve transport justice um, and because as as you see the transport inequality in the netherlands is already uh, uh, a lot higher than you would expect but i think the situation will be even worse worse in toronto i talked to kenshin and owen and he told me that uh, the areas uh, where we're talking about, where we're discussing uh, realizing a bicycle bridge, a lot of people don't own a car. And if you don't own a car in Toronto, you've got uh, quite a job to go to access a job. Um, and only in areas with excellent access to jobs by bike and transit, low income class, class people have adequate access to job. So it's very important to level infrastructure barriers and it's the only way to achieve adequate access to job and other means of deployment and um then everybody says yeah but bicycle bridges are so expensive but i i didn't do a cost benefit analysis in uh in canada but in the netherlands two bridges of the river Waal they did a cost benefit analysis and investing in cycle bridges is four times more remunerative than the average car infrastructure investment we also did an analysis on investment in daily urban systems in the north and the south of the netherlands with a method which is called the new look at accessibility and uh, the result was that investing in bike and transport transit 
yields more than four times extra accessible jobs and amenities than investing in cars. And I also um, quote the Copenhagen cost benefit analysis. They have a very, very long bridge, the Island Bro, uh, and that had a higher cost benefit yield than any car investment. So if you could say you can, you get a lot of value for your money. Although you might think, oh my God, that's a lot of money. When you would think about investing in, for instance, car infrastructure, uh, that is so, uh, that is often more expensive. And what is more um, uh, is the whole car system is so saturated that any new uh, car infrastructure will yield, yield very little um, extra value in, in, in terms of accessibility. Well, here you got some um, examples from already uh, realized um, Toronto examples. You see the Garrison Crossing, uh, which for a length of 52 meters uh, costed $20 million. Um, here is the... Uh, Hans. Um... Yeah. This is Kanchen here. Um, this is uh, these slides here were meant to be part of our breakout session, okay. not necessarily part of this. Yeah. Okay. Well, then I think the rest will also be part of the breakout session. I think. Sorry that to to, uh, to mix them up, but um, what I try to show is uh, that uh, to help you uh, to in. But the thing is, when you uh, are uh, thinking about bicycle bridges, uh, it's important that you think about it in uh, access for people, uh, for jobs, for instance, who don't have a car, because then you me really mean something uh, about equity. So that is also important that when prioritizing uh, bicycle bridges, then think first uh, where are they, give they access to jobs and to other amenities for people who can't afford, car, can't afford cars. Okay, thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Thomas, Mary and Hans for your excellent presentations. And we will now go to the breakout portion of the, uh, of the morning. Um, so I'm going to create the breakout rooms at this moment, and uh, everyone can choose the breakout room that they wish to participate in. Um, and if you're having trouble uh, selecting a breakout room, please mention your name and the breakout room you would like to select in the chat box and we can assign it for you. So. Um, yeah, let's bring that slide back up again. Breakout room number one is cycling in transit. That will be hot apple and uh, breakout number two, access management and intersections with Mobicon. A case study on University Avenue and breakout room number three, unique cycling infrastructure. But how, how do I? Yeah, just one sec. I'm going to open, open oh, yeah. all oh, yeah. the, there you go. So the rooms are now open and you can choose the breakout room you would like to participate in. And we will return to this larger room for the last 10 minutes of the session just to discuss uh, what everybody learned and, and took from the their session. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, hopefully, your discussion was uh, as varied and fruitful as, uh, as the one I was sitting in. But I, I get the sense that everyone could have gone for uh, much longer, unfortunately. Uh, we only have the allotted time available, and, and hopefully it leaves some more food for, for thought for future sessions. But I'm going to give each group an opportunity to kind of take three or four minutes to report back to the larger group and summarize uh, the conversation they had and potential solutions. 
but please keep it tight as we do need to finish uh, at the top of the hour sharp. So uh, breakout session number one, the cycling and transit group. Is there anyone that would like to say a few words about uh, their findings? We have Eric is going to speak, but I promised I would put up the notes I took to support him <laughs> so you guys can take a look. And uh, Eric, we've got this slide and then let me know when you want me to move. Uh, we have one more slide of notes about the bikeway design. All right, for the interest of time, I'll just quickly uh, describe the, uh, the situation. Uh, so it is at Victoria Park. Uh, there is a subway station, uh, but there is also bike facilities. So it's kind of like a mobility health integration exercise uh, where the first question is asking what kind of information we would like to collect. Uh, as you can see on the screen, I'm not going to repeat all of them, but you know, the, the key part of it, uh, other than the, the basic speed and volume, what kind of um, properties and, and so on, uh, potential development uh, in the future, I think that is uh, uh, something that, that we can also look at in, in terms of uh, looking at what we just learned uh, by dealing with all the infrastructure like, let's deal with the root cause if we can minimize all the first and last mile trips uh, and then um, uh, other things uh, street parkings uh, the demographic of trips uh, of the trip patterns and the trip purposes and all that I think this is also important to know uh, where they're going to and from um, and uh, let me see if there's any other key parts uh, in the bike shed station. Uh, maybe this is also good uh, to go to the next question because this is where the, all the details are. So next slide. Um, so after we collect a whole bunch of information, uh, what can we do in terms of any quick wins and any bigger pictures, um, uh, things that we can do, um, uh, looking at all sorts of uh, like design elements on how we can uh, put uh, the vulnerable road users into priority, right? In terms of increasing space for, for the cyclists in, in terms of uh, where they're cycling to, uh, to the station, um, whether we can use the, um, uh, the boulevard space or even integration with the uh, with the existing parking lot uh, to minimize uh, the, the interactions uh, with, between cyclists and vehicles on the main arterial road of Victoria Park um, and other safe features like race, uh, grade separated, uh, physically separated infrastructures. Uh, and, and one thing I also learned uh, from our cycling team from Becky is that uh, really the fundamental uh, way to, 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 uh, to, to plan appropriately for the cycling is to reduce vehicles in terms of their uh, volume and speed. Uh, what, what can we do to, uh, to minimize the, uh, the traffic uh, on Victoria Park? And uh, what we do around the station to improve the connections, uh, we talk about um, uh, again, dedicated uh, facilities for, for the bikeway, uh, either through a bridge uh, structure. And today we learned that uh, the, the cost benefit ratio is actually quite high elsewhere. So maybe we can prove the case in Toronto as well. Uh, um, and there are certainly some demand there uh, going all directions to the station. Um, food trucks, of course, uh, putting more and more pressure, uh, more, more amenities around the station. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, planning it like a mobility hub uh, to look at all users. Use of tunnel, uh, I think that's another creative idea. Yeah, um, I think that's great. Thank you, right, Eric. Thank you. Uh, we can pass it over to the next group. Okay, thank you so much for volunteering, Eric. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to the Mobicon folks and who would like to report from uh, breakout session number two. That'll be me. Uh, we looked at a, an intersection of uh, University Avenue and Adelaide Street West, which currently looks like this. And we wanted to explore what we could do to uh, turn it into a, a protected intersection with certain elements, uh, both in the long term, if you do do civil reconstruction or in the short term uh, with um, pop-up elements. Uh, so step one would be to push the uh, pedestrian crossings back a little bit to create some space within the intersection. Uh, oh, no, this worked better. Yeah, there we go. Um, I'm just going through this very quickly. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, step two would be to use the bend out or bend in, uh, however you want to call it, to create uh, that buffer space that Mary talked about for, for creating a buffer time and buffer space for right turning vehicles to respond to anything um, in the conflict zone, basically. Uh, this also reduces the, the, the exposure time for pedestrians uh, and for cyclists in the, in the long term. And then step three is where you turn it into a, a real protected intersection by filling in the corners with uh, some vertical element. Um, obviously this requires some concrete to be poured 
Um, but then you really have a, a protected intersection with the biggest advantage uh, being the stop bar located all the way to the front, which means that cyclists are really directly in the line of sight of drivers sitting at the, the traffic light. So for example, a right turning vehicle will already know that there's a, a bike that's gonna go ahead first and a bike gets that um, both, both uh, time and space advantage when the light turns green because they can go first and be across to the other side safely before they even have a chance of being uh, hit by a by tuning car, um, a bit crude, but yeah. Um, this is a three a three legs have a cycling infrastructure. Um, so the, the the southbound cyclists along University Avenue will, will have a little gap here to be able to do a safe two stage left turn. But for a straight through cyclist, they'll just be able to merge with traffic because there's no receiving cycle lane for them. Um, given that. Uh, pouring concrete is expensive and difficult. If you would want to do a short-term intervention, uh, the key would be to get these little vertical elements in on the corners, uh, which the city is already experimenting with, but that's, yeah, we think that is really key uh, because that does allow you to get that cyclist to wait here in a protected space by some sort of bollard if they get run over. Recommendation would be to get a bigger bollard. <laughs> Um, and get that safe space where uh, bikes can can wait. You don't have all the features of a of a protected intersection, but you also don't need to cut into the curb and um, and do any civil work. So that would be um, the recommendation for this intersection. And it's nice to hear that the city is is working on those uh, kind of interventions. So that's good. That's all from us. Thanks so much, Leonard. And is there anyone from group number three that would like to present on their behalf? Yeah, sure, I will. Um, so we talked about uh, bridges, and I'm just gonna, uh, okay, uh, Hans is sharing. So if you could uh, just scroll, uh, that's the wrong side, I'll, I'll share on, on my side. Um, so we've got, uh, uh, we, we picked this, a case study location at the north end of the uh, West Toronto Rail Path uh, corridor, um, wh which ends just north of DuPont, and uh, um, there's a there's a east-west rail line, and and looking at how we can get across that rail line up to um, the St. Clair area and the future GO station, and and some and some additional uh, bikeway, trail, cycle track connections uh, that will be built in that area, and so we. Uh, we, we, it's kind of hard to workshop a bridge <laughs> in 45 minutes. Um, so we talked a little bit more generally around the types of things that we would be, be looking at. Uh, we had some excerpts from the Crow guidelines. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think what we concluded overall uh, was that the initial route that we were thinking about, which was from the end of Miller Street here down to Caribou Avenue, which is where the which is where the rail path ends. That's about 150 meters in total, uh, but that it would be really challenging to get either an overpass or an underpass uh, into this uh, into this location, um, given the the density of of both houses and industrial uses in the area. Um, you know, we, we discussed how in the Netherlands uh, that under uh, overpasses are usually less expensive, um, but because of having to cross a rail line, they ha would have longer uh, approach approach ramps. But that an underpass, you know, though the clearance might be a bit less than an overpass, you would still want a pretty significant clearance to um, so that people can can see through and have uh, good personal personal safety. Uh, we noted that there's a um, this this parcel here on the east side of Old Weston Road is is actually a, a, a recent development application that just came in, and so uh, we're we, I think where we ended up was that maybe a, a shorter connection to Miller is 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 you know maybe more constrained that maybe it would be more suitable to look at something a bit longer, uh, maybe incorporating uh, the edge of that development site and get a connection that's closer to uh, that, that connects closer to the station and has more room for those for those ramps to to, to land. But I think ultimately this would uh, need need quite a bit more work to to work through feasibility and uh, and, and and the other uh, considerations. Okay, thank you so much, Owen. We are right on time. So I'm just gonna take this opportunity to wrap up and uh, 
to say some closing words. Bear me with me as I reshare my screen. Um, so thank you very much for, for your attendance, for your attention, for your participation in this workshop. We hope that it was uh, maybe a conversation starter rather than uh, an end in and of itself. Um, the tremendous interest uh, leads us to believe that uh, we'll be back sooner rather than later. We're already discussing the next uh, virtual workshop uh, before Christmas, maybe, and 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 then hopefully with some some actual study tours and workshops uh, in the new year. But uh, allow me to acknowledge the experts for the time they spent preparing their presentations and their case studies. Uh, again, Katie at the City of Toronto and Severa at the Consul General put a lot of hours into making this happen. Um, and uh, we will um, close out with something we've been doing at, at uh, similar workshops um, that we found is quite useful is that I'm going to reopen the breakout sessions, the three breakout sessions, uh, and drop the experts back in there. And if you want to have a short conversation with them, exchange business cards virtually, ask a question, uh, or just have a short chat with them, uh, they will hopefully stick around for a few minutes. Uh, and uh, and do a little bit of uh, informal networking. Uh, but for those of you that have other meetings to duck out to, thank you for joining us. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you again sooner rather than later. Bye for now. <laughs>